Okay, so uh, welcome to you all. Um, I'm Howard Redwood. I am a head of road safety at the DIA, and um, I've put together the webinar um, for today, which is mainly aimed at the fleet market. Um, it's a webinar which title is How has fleet been affected by COVID-19? Um, quite a, a large topic really, but there's other things I need to talk about as well because we have people uh, I know beforehand who came to me and said, are you able to mention a little bit what fleet is and how assessments, etc., are done? So what we're going to be covering is Thomas very kindly moved on. Um, it's describing what fleet is and company obligations, especially at this time um, with uh, the COVID-19 obligations in many different directions, to be honest. Dynamic risk assessments, what are they and how they've changed? Subjective marking and um, risk, weight, risk weighting, which is what the ADIs who don't know much about fleet were mainly concerned about. They were the ones that spoke to me were sort of concerned that is it done on the AD on the uh, DR, DL25? Well, of course it's not. You know that's doesn't play very much part in a, a fleet role at all. So, um, what we're talking about then is let's move that off so I can see. There we go. If you can move on, please, uh, Tom. So, what is fleet? Well, basically, it's company obligations and. Um, we are at a situation where we have to adhere to the legislation. And at the moment, we're working under the Coronavirus Regulations 2020, which came out in March, signed off by Her Majesty on the 17th of March, um, in terms of driver training. Uh, yes, we still work to the Road Traffic Act and all the other acts that are there, but in terms of um, most things going on at the moment, which due to the force majeure, is <coughs> is working um, through the, um, is that you, Tom, making noises there? Yeah, okay. Uh, so what it is, is, um, is we have to work under loads of legislation. The one that is temporary regulations, as opposed to legislation, is the uh, Coronavirus Regulations 2020. There are some offshoots from that, which uh, affects the health and safety at work, um, i.e. the making sure that social distancing takes place and also ensuring that we have got um, sanitization in place, that there are systems put in for people who have been furloughed and goodness knows what else, there's all sorts of things to take place. So there are many company ob obligations referring to occupational safety and health that have to take place. Driving is part of it. That still has to take place. There's no excuse for uh, companies not ensuring that they are covering the assessments that are required for their drivers under the Management of Health and Safety Regulations 1999. Now that uh, regulation is uh, an amendment, part of the amendments to the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, which says that any vehicle being used uh, for the purposes of transportation or conveyance uh, comes under, it, it comes under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, as an extension of the workplace. So many organisations tend to think that the workplace is just the bricks and mortar of a building and perhaps a car park. But once things are off site, they tend to forget that they still have responsibility for the way that vehicle is being handled. So competency based assessments must be done on a regular basis. And that's what the Management of Health and Safety 1999 regulations say that it has to be done on a regular basis. It doesn't stipulate what regular basis is. So that's a little bit subjective and it's dependent upon the uh, type of business that is working. So if you've got transport and the guys are doing hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the motorway, then perhaps they're going to have assessments done on fatigue, distraction, etc. But if you've got someone who is driving as a rep, who may be doing um, a lot of driving, but on a smaller area where they're not going to be driving for any more than about 35 minutes at a time, then perhaps their assessments would be different. If you've got someone who is a key member of a company, for example, they could be the wages clerk who cannot be, um, cannot be replaced by an agency staff, 
then they might need looking at to make sure that although they don't drive for the business, that they can actually drive into work and home from work safely so that they don't impede the business with their absence if anything went wrong. So there are several obligations that companies have uh, to their staff in terms of fleet. If you could move on, please, Tom. So we're looking at the next slide, which is training and recruitment. The um, effects on the business, there's been many job role changes, uh, especially in the lockdown where roles were stretched, staff were um, reduced in numbers, people had to do new job roles, uh, new roles created even as well. Um, but the, the probably the biggest problem we've had, the second bullet point is misplaced recruitment. And that's where uh, people have been brought into the business and because, especially in the food transport and the dot-com industries with uh, Amazon, no sort of place, places, that the driver had a Category B driving license, was recruited and was given a set of keys and off they went. And therefore, their inductions, if any, to the vehicle or to the company would have been minimal. They would have been literally get out on the road, let's try and make hay while while the sun shines in order to get money, keep the business turning over, etc., with very little responsibility or very little regard for um, legislation of, well, they kept the legislation, but very little regard for giving the time necessary to the person. Certainly wouldn't mean client-centered. Um, you know, anybody who has learning difficulties would have just been told to get on with it. No, we've told you what to do. What's wrong with you type thing? And that's been happening quite a bit. Uh, Driving for Better Business has reported this, um, and Highways England, I uh, believe, have also made noises about this being going on as well when people have been stopped and um, the traffic officers have actually, uh, when they've had to pull up, for instance, uh, on the bigger vehicles, have found that the drivers have been told that they've had no induction on the vehicles that have broken down. And in fact, when the breakdown guy has turned up, it's been something very simple indeed. There's actually been a switch on the dashboard in some instances where these guys have not had inductions. So this misplaced recruitment during pandemics um, and double standards of driver competence, you may have people in an organization that's been driving for many years for that organization and have had their assessments, but then when the new people have come in because the organization has expanded due to the COVID situation and stuff has got to be delivered, that the, as we've just mentioned with the um, inductions and recruitments being, the, the induction process is being reduced that you've effectively got a double standard of driver in some companies. Um, some driving vehicles they're not used to that have gone from vans into um, from, from th two and a half ton vans to three and a half ton vans and probably gone up because they've got CPC, have gone into seven and a half ton environment. Um, they can't do it on grandfather rights because that's uh, for money's worth and for profit. But they may have had the um, licenses for LGV in the past, fallen out of favour with it, but kept the CPC going, but have needed to have the inductions on the vehicles, especially now most of them are automatic. There's very few manual gear change and, and um, what they call the split, splitter boxes available now. So they've had to be reappraised on the gear ratios, etc., on pulling out on roundabouts with load, etc. And so these, these things have all been missed. Um, and so there's a double standards of driver competence and changes in systems, talking about um, the new work patterns and social distancing. Uh, I, I can speak um, a lot about the food delivery industry. Uh, that's my background. I did 15 years in transport. Um, I do a lot of fleet work for Ocado and I understand the Tesco situation. My, my brother is one of the area managers for Tesco. So the situation that I have the information there is that the the um, new regimes put in for the delivery during the COVID time, um, where before the deliveries were allowed to be taken to the house. Well, of course, that stopped. Everything had to be left on the doorstep or even with a phone call prior to the delivery. If it is found that COVID was within the environs of the house, then the deliveries, uh, I know Tesco's, were actually delivering to the front gate only and leaving a um, a phone message to say the goods were there, they drove off and the people picked them up afterwards. Um, so the Challenge 25 things, that became a problem with the 
valuable goods and alcohol in the deliveries and the consignments that all had to be changed so there's been a lot of changes and where there's been double manned driving with transport companies um, there's been although the cabs are wider still hasn't really been two meters so there's had to be additional safeguarding uh, put in place in terms of teams put together where the same pair driver and driver's mate work together for the entire week so it's the same team come into contact with each other to minimize different households working together and taking contamination back into their own homes. Um, also, uh, in some instances, dress codes, where they've been told to wear long sleeves and long trousers uh, in order to avoid contact of skin with contact points in the vehicle. Now, we know COVID is airborne, um, but it does sit on the skin and it can be uh, got onto the hands and the hands wipe the eyes and you wipe the nose, etc., and that's the ingest areas that it gets into the body is what's what's known. That's why we're wearing masks for the nose, and um, and all the other things we put in into place in terms of um, the sanitization for the vehicles has all been put in, and it's a higher standard in transport. So it's probably as high as higher standard as what we're putting in for driver training in terms of wipe downs between. Um, drivers especially and, and deep cleaner vehicles in the transport industry is now a common practice where they are uh, during the night if they're not being used deep cleaned by a team of people during the night also um, in the bigger vehicles you often see lorries driving around with lots of debris in the dashboard or uh, in the on the windowsill on, on the front window that's all been told to be cleared now because um, distraction, etc. But it's the handling of things. Everything has to have a place in a cab now, which is uh, driving for better business of, of try to champion. So training and recruitment, things have changed. Companies have had to put these things in place. Uh, the timelines for deliveries have had to be adapted. Um, so set times for deliveries where guys were on set routes and were told that it had to be 11 minutes past a certain hour to get to a delivery for a Tesco or Sainsbury's back door. That's all changed now because um, the, the Sainsbury's and Tesco back door regime has changed and entering onto site has changed. So everything's become a bit more elastic and uh, people have had to change. And we are creatures of habit. We don't like change. It takes us as humans a long time to adapt and adjust and our behaviors uh, take a long time to to redevelop into a new system. So that is also affecting the fleet trainer as well, where a trainer, sorry, a, a candidate or a, a client has been given a certain role and the role has changed, uh, means that their vehicle, if they're driving a saloon vehicle or an estate vehicle, may now be carrying different goods to what they're used to. And quite often they chuck on the back seat and it stays there, whereas we know it should go in the boot or it should go behind the rear seat belts and be tied down, etc. But because they are not used to carrying this sort of stuff and haven't had the induction on that, uh, we might have our roles changed to say, look, I know I'm here for the driver training, but how about the safety inside the capsule that you're in? You know, these sort of things now have to be brought to the fore in the driver training that we do. If you could move on, please, uh, Tom. So we're now looking at the dynamic risk and, and it's difficult to people to get their head around what dynamic risk is. It's saying so, so uh, out there, sort of, people don't understand the word dynamic. What it is, is if there are five steps for a dynamic risk and what we call it is, is ADAR. It used to be Poppymar in the old days, um, which was a, have a policy and um, organize to get that thing sorted. So it was then, um, so it's it policy, organize, um, implement, monitor, audit, and review. What we've got now is IADAR, which is identify the hazards in the first place. So as it says here, anything that can cause harm because a employer has a duty to assess. So it's identify and assess, decide who may be harmed, assess the risk, record 
and review. And this is where the management of health and safety 1999 comes into. It's the record and review. The review would be when is that assessment needed? And that's obviously going to be uh, according to the risk that is found from the driver, the driver's competence and abilities. Also, we must also be certain that we take into consideration the conditions that that driver is driving in, whether it be the vehicle that they are driving. So we take um, we make allowances for the vehicle size of how they're driving it, the load. Some some assessments by fleet trainers has to be done when the vehicle's loaded, and it's now becoming quite common that the trainer has to go out on a route with someone and actually do the driving assessment while they're en route. I've, I've had to do that a few times. I've had to check my insurance is valid for that, and it is. Uh, but I've had it on several occasions for a certain electrical company that goes out and delivers stuff on site to building sites, um, cables, etc. that have to go out and fittings and that. And I've got to do the driving assessment while this guy is out on route. Um, and he is given a four hour route and I've got four hours to, to work with him. I also have to help him unload and do his um, manual lifting, man manual handling uh, under the um, LOLA regulations, lifting, operating and lifting equipment regulations when they've got tail lifts on the back and also the uh, pure regulation, provision and use of working equipment regulations and just check that they're doing that properly as well. That's that's uh, part of it too. Uh, that is starting to get asked for now by organizations for uh, fleet trainers. And um, that is something that you'd have to go away and get trained to do to make sure that you are competent in that anyway. So the IRDAR is, is what we are using now, is what industry tends to be using. They might call it another word as well. There is another shorter mnemonic for it, which um, ROSP will use. But effectively, it's identify the hazards, assess health and safety risks, decide who may be harmed, um, assess the risk to take action, and record the findings and review. So the recording is obviously going to be the report that is written to the client or to the manager, etc., if we could move on, please, Tom. So this is where we now come to subjective versus objective and where it comes to the marking categories. Um, the most common ones are a one, two, three, four category where four may be the most dangerous um, situation on a um, marking sheet, which will show you a example of a typical marking sheet in a moment for those who aren't in fleet. For the fleet guys that are in fleet, then um, and we might be teaching you to suck eggs here a little bit, but uh, organizations in many instances do actually supply the assessment marking sheet. And I must now bring to your attention that there are usually two different types of fleet trainer. There are the fleet assessor, who is asked to go into an organization and merely assess as a gatekeeper. And they might go to an organization who are doing recruitment, who need reasonably large numbers of new drivers. And what they, the organization wants is to find out the base level of the competence that the drivers have in order to see whether it is worth investing in them. The higher competence that driver has, the less risk they are to the occupational safety and health policy of the organization and less development costs that are going to be involved. And of course, they're the people they want. So you may do assessing only, or you may do assessment and development, which is what most of the home delivery food organizations do, like Sainsbury's, Tesco, Zocado, um, those type of people. The, the people like Amazon, uh, DHL, they are um, not of the same vein. They might have to um, half a day with a guy in a vehicle if it's required. Or it might be that you go in there to do um, uh, post-crash training with them. They might have had an accident and you go in there. So again, it would be assessment and development. Assess what the driving standard is at the beginning. Do the development and do an assessment again at the end. And the marking sheet we're going to be showing you is of that caliber is that type of, of sheet so when you are marking and wait and subjective versus objective we're not looking and thinking at all of the dl25 marking sheet where an examiner will go on a driving test 
and he will, at suitable times in the assessment, during the assessment, mark a form um, as to the um, validity of a driving fault. What a driving examiner has to consider is, has a fault taken place? In which case, if no fault has taken place or there's no no damage, no um, danger or any any area that might be regarded as bordering on dangerous, then nothing's marked. So a driving fault, they'll put down if there's like an injudicious gear change, which has caused the vehicle to change speed or to jolt, or it's, it's slightly inconvenient to somebody else, it might go as a driving fault. But then you get your, your seriously dangerous faults is where it really depends on the acumen of the driver on how they've perceived the situation they are in and what response they've made to the input of information they've received. Has their input been appropriate, or has the output, should I say, be appropriate to the input of information they've taken on board? Have they responded at the right time? Have they done the correct response? And um, have they allowed enough time for everything to take place? And that's what borders on the, um, on the, um, dr- on the dangerous and the serious faults. This is not quite the same with the subjective versus subjective on the on the fleet. What we're looking at is you've got a driver who has a full driving license. You, you don't do fleet to provisional license holders. That doesn't really happen. It's to full license holders. So we know that they have passed a driving assessment. What we have to find out is, was that driving assessment taking place in this country? Are they driving on an exchange license? Are they driving on a European license, which allows them to drive in this country um, up to their 70th birthday anyway? So we've we've got to sort of find out about the person in the first place. Um, And we then mark according to the actions that they do. And this obviously does depend on the vehicle they're driving. So you've got a few waiting allowances here. You have to understand the vehicle they are driving. So if you're driving in the higher categories, if you're assessing in the higher categories, you must be confident and competent about all those vehicles as well. Now, we've got the anomaly at the moment where an ADI on grandfather rights is able to do driver development on a seven and a half ton without a seven and a half ton license. They can do it on grandfather rights. The problem they've got is they could get tied up in knots on the theory side of it because they may or may not have done the CPC. So the driver beside them is actually more qualified than what the instructor is. And that is a big loophole that we have at the moment. They can't go into category C without having done, having passed the category C test and held it for so many years uh, and also be on uh, on a register or on the voluntary register possibly. But in terms of the seven and a half ton, that's the, that's the knee jerk one where an AGI is currently able on their driving license, if they've got grandfather rights and it, they may not have even driven a seven and a half ton in their life, but they are actually at the moment able to go into seven and a half ton vehicle and do driver development with a seven and a half ton driver who has got who is licensed on that seven and a half ton vehicle, who's done a test and has got CPC. So what we have to do is to be assured that we are competent with the vehicle that we are doing the assessing in. And we must be able to know all about that vehicle and really have had experience of driving them ourselves to be able to um, check how the outputs of the driver is uh, compared to what we would done as an output in that vehicle. So when you're marking, you're looking at the actions that they do and whether they produce danger or, uh, or not and you grade the mark accordingly. And we'll go through the grading categories in a section, in a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. So we have to be competent with the vehicle, whether it be van. So if you're an ADI, you normally train learners at the moment, and you want to get into fleet, you can be expected to go into vehicles up to three and a half ton on a category B vehicle. That vehicle could be a box vehicle. It could be a long wheelbase vehicle panel van. It could be a um, medium wheelbase or a short wheelbase. So you need to understand um, how that driver is dealing when he's turning right with the tail swing for an overhang on a long wheelbase Mercedes Sprinter when he's got a bus trying to pass him on his near side. 
Now, should he make the turn? Has he got space, etc.? Now, if you're not driving those vehicles, you haven't driven those vehicles, then you need ideally to get the experience on these vehicles. And I mean, copious amounts of experience so that when you talk to these people, you're talking with authority. You can't just go talking according to the highway code. All right, you'll be using the highway code. You'll use the highway code rules and regulations to help give them education. But you have to have the experience yourself of driving these vehicles because if they come back at you with, well, if I do that, what happens about this? You've got to have the experience to say, well, that shouldn't happen. If you do it this way, it won't happen. So we're in a situation looking at the categories. Let's look at this category marking of number four, which would be actual potential danger in you know, with you being beside a driver. So it's an action that produces a danger to the safety of the occupants, the vehicle or other road users. And this would include actual contact with another object where no evasive action or a late evasive action was made. The assessment would be terminated in the interest of road safety. And that doesn't mean to say you get out of the vehicle and abandon them on the side of the road in fleet. It means you stop that assessment there and then, and you talk through what's happened there, and you start your development at that point. Now, this means that you have got a lot more work to do. You've got to think on your feet. You've got to look, manage the time better. You've got to try and revive, get rid of this problem that they've got. I mean, it, when I'm talking about contact, let's just go into a situation where they've gone and knocked a near side mirror in a, um, in a three and a half ton van on a branch sticking out of a hedge on a country road they haven't broken the mirror, but they've gone and bent the mirror back in so much that it's gone and smacked against the side window. Now, that, in my view, is bad judgment on the width of the vehicle, on the width of the road, on the speed that guy should be going down the road, etc. So that would be, in my view, a termination of the assessment at that time. Pull them over as soon as you can, stop the rest of the assessment, say, right, we're going to stop the assessment now, which I should be doing for you, and we're going to talk about the incident here. And then... If you've seen right up to that point of impact that they are driving too close to uh, the proximity issues they've got with parked vehicles um, or they have got a problem with speed for the width of the road or they're driving too fast over the undulations in the road, then this is where you start using those as your main areas of concern. You also need ideally to do a second assessment later on, which we'll talk about, and base your report but in your report you would definitely have to put in the fact that you had to you had to stop the first assessment because impact took place and of course there's no way is that person going to come in smelling of roses on that on that at the end of that session you can't possibly go putting in to that assessment uh, on that report that that guy is going to be of a low risk uh, it's not possible to do that could we move on please tom So marking a category three is possible inappropriate actions is what you would uh, deem there. Now just bear with me one second because um, I'm having uh, a little bit of internet problems here and the screen is going a bit snowy. So bear with me a second if you will. And I'll just make sure that I've got the second screen where it should be. Okay, right. So looking at the, at the assessment marking sheet for number three, um, possible inappropriate actions. Now, bear in mind that these are not marked like an examiner does on a DL25 in the course of the assessment. All these things are marked at the end of the assessment. So you're going to be making notes and jottings of what these people are doing. So Actions which were causing the driver to react in an appropriate, inappropriate manner include innate reactions, ra lack of planning and observation, which in general was causing slight concerns to safety of driver occupants, vehicles, and other road users. At the moment, guys, the people who are quite uh, adept with fleet, these sort of things we are getting, and it's going back to what I said earlier on about people being moved into a vehicle that they have not been familiarized with. So your situation with the COVID-19, they've probably been taken on a uh, and, and be moved into a area in their job where their job has been expanded 
and they've been pushed into a driving role where they used to be a warehouseman's role, for example. And as a result of that, um, they are really, although they can drive, they've got a category B license, they would need a little bit of familiarization with the vehicle. It might mean getting them out of the vehicle during the development time and going through and saying, no, no, you're used to driving a small van with you and one passenger seat on the side. You're looking through the front windscreen now, at, you know, standing in front of the vehicle and saying, look, you've got another seat there. Look how much wider that is. And then add on the extra width on the mirrors. And this is the sort of stuff we've got to start doing now with these COVID-19 guys that have been taken on because the evidence that's come from Highways England and Drive a Better Business is there's a lot of this situation taking place out on the roads now. So if your clients that you've had before are saying we need to take on new people, then ask them what happened during COVID-19 and who was taken on during the COVID-19. Have they actually had proper inductions? And perhaps you can start getting yourself engaged to going in there and saying, look, do you want me to take uh, put people put some of them in the classroom either with social distancing and go through some stuff on PowerPoints with them because the company may not be able to afford to let those people go on the road at the moment. But as long as under their Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, do some interventions that are regarded as reasonably practicable to overcome a problem, then you going into the classroom and doing a classroom session with them in order to help them bring them up would actually suffice in a court of law. Unless these people are obviously banging the vans around and crashing, in which case you would have a case to say, well, look, look at the damage costs you've got here. That is more than likely because the LCV familiarization program that your company has got didn't take place. These guys ideally need to go through that full program. Let me have them for half a day or let me have on, uh, if, if possible, a two to one. Now, what I did... Um, I've just finished training some internal assessors at a company at Park Royal. And what they did for me to do this was to hire a nine-seater minibus so I could get them both in the vehicle at the same time. One was in the front with me, one was in the back, making notes in the back, and we changed them over, wiping the vehicle down at all times. And that worked really well because they're still able to learn off each other, and we kept the social distance over one metre plus. And it worked really well indeed. And it could be a suggestion you could make to the companies if they've got more than one. I know if it's a, like a transit van they're driving, a medium wheel-based transit van, for example, that they're driving around, um, it would give the company an opportunity to get more than one person out on the road at the same time. It might be even be able to stretch that to a three to one if you had a whole day with them. And that is actually quite more cost effective to a company. Um, if it's that type of vehicle that they are driving anyway, uh, if obviously if it's a box vehicle, um, then it's not going to not going to be uh, any good to them. Um, so this is sort of what's happening. How things are changing in the fleet market now for the guys that are out there with the COVID thing. There are new challenges we are facing at the moment. So there's uh, one or two things there to be aware of. Uh, if you could move on, please, Tom. So we're looking at marking category two which would now be the minor deficiencies in driving. And these are minor weaknesses which are regarded to cause undue concern to the driver or occupants of the vehicle or other road users, such as this injudicious gear change that they do now again. They may um, be in a situation where they hold the vehicle on a foot brake at a junction in a queue a bit longer than you want them to. Um, they might be a situation where they knock it into neutral just before they come to stop which is uh, it's one of my pet hates. I don't know why it is, but it is. Um, but it's um, something they shouldn't really do, but they do. So these sort of things are where you put down as a, as a number two, um, where the vehicle, there's no danger taking place to the vehicle. It's generally being driven fairly well uh, with respect uh, to uh, eco and also to uh, sympathy. Um, and they're generally looking down the road far enough ahead to be, uh, aware of who is on the pavements, who's likely to cross the road, when lights are likely to change ahead of them and they're doing something about it. So they're giving some sort of responsibility to their drive and responsibility of consideration to their load. Uh, I know you appreciate that you do drive a lot of the time when you're doing van work, they're doing them empty. But um, I think nowadays with the fact that we've had the situation of the shortcuts in um 
in inductions that you may have to, during part of your development, ask them to drive as if the vehicle was loaded and see what their driving ability is then. So say, right, you're now carrying a pallet of paper in the back if, if they're doing uh, stationary delivery, if it's somebody like uh, DHL who has got an empty van out with you and say, right, you've now got um, uh, four beds in there or you've got a couple of trampolines in the back, um, put those, put the, you do that scenario. Uh, stuff is reasonably heavy, which is not overweighting the vehicle that you can use as scenarios. Um, so number two, minor weaknesses which are regarded to cause undue concern to the driver or occupants, the vehicle or other road users. Obviously other road users being pedestrians, cyclists, horse riders as well. Um, if we could move on please, Tom. And one is a high standard of driving, showing a high regard in terms of confidence, competence, care, consideration, courtesy and safety to themselves, passengers, vehicle and all other road users. Now, I urge you, please, to read the trainer magazine that is coming out. It's about to come out, issue seven. In there is my report on um, the reports written to companies using those six competencies. OK, confidence, competence, care, consideration, courtesy and safety. Now, if you evolve a report around those six disciplines, that is the report that would stand up in court and would be exactly what either the driver is looking for if you're told to write to the driver or the manager is looking for if you're told to write it to the manager. Um, and it's, it's only a sort of paragraph on each, all it is, but I've, I've actually put that in the trainer magazine, which should be hitting your mats in the next few days. So I'd urge you to read that report, please. Um, and that will back up what I'm saying here now to you that, that have uh, kindly taken your time to listen to this today. So if we move on, please. Looking at the assessment scoring, now we'll look at the assessment form in just a minute. We're looking at the assessment scoring. Um, if they, you add up all your fours, your threes, your twos, and your ones, if you've got a form that has um, 20 descriptors on it, i.e. seating position, um, approaching junctions, use of, hand, uh, use of controls, etc. If you've got 20 of those on there, then 0 to 20, if they score, because what ones are obviously what they want, ones and twos are what they want, not to 20 would, would be low risk. Okay, so that means they're going to get a one on every single box pretty much. Now, if you've got a form that has 25 descriptors on it, then not to 25 would be green. Okay, so if we look now at 21 to 30 being amber, 21 out of uh, I mean, the maximum score on a 20 descriptor uh, form would be out of 80. And on a 25 descriptor would be 100 because they could get all fours and four 25s is 100. Four 20s is 80. So uh, on a 20 descriptor, 0 to 20 would be green, 21 to 30 would be amber, 31 to 80 would be red. On a 25 descriptor form, which might be given to you by an organization, 0 to 25 green, 26 to 38 would be amber, 39 to 100 would be red. Now, why those odd numbers? If you look at 21 out of 80 is 26%. So out of 100, 26 out of 100 is 26%. 30 out of 80 is 38%. 38 of 100 is 38%. So you're marking in the same vein all the time. You're, you're keeping... The, um, the the values of the grading the same for either form. There's no discrepancies there in the marking. Your recommendations to management is going to depend on what you've been engaged to do. If you've been engaged to do assessing only, on your green, you'd put down, yes, employ for driving. If you're going to put an amber, you'd put in there, a consider for driving um, for driving tasks. If you put down on the red, you'd put down in there, do not employ for driving tasks. Don't say do not employ, because 
it costs organizations a lot of money to do interviews. And remember, this is part in, the, in this assessing only, you're part of the interview process, uh, especially with people coming out of COVID, job roles changing, that there are um, people who are um, already employed by the business who are now moving into driving roles. So you can't go and say to them, oh, don't employ them, where well, they're already employed. So you've got to be careful of our wording here. So you would put down there, do not employ for the driving part of the business. So it means that they could still be employed in the company in the warehouse or somewhere else. And the company has spent the money on the interviews um, can make some benefit from the cost of that interview process. So you've got to be a little bit careful on how you word yourself there, really. Um, what we're doing here about risk weighting, it says in the title there, is that weighting is safety versus competence. Now, we've already gone back about you must be able to be confident and competent yourself and have experience of the vehicles you're assessing in. That's that's given. OK, you can't really go assess someone if you don't know all about that vehicle yourself. OK, so when we're looking at weighting, the weighting is safety versus competence. You are measuring the competence of the of the client, the, the, the driver against your competence base that you would have done. So your reactions you would have done in that environment at that time in that scenario you're just comparing what they've done to what you've done. Now, how you now move this on is safety versus competence equals emotions of trainer versus the actions of the candidate. So if you're getting emotive and you're getting a bit, a bit frightened by some of the things they're doing, something is wrong. Something has got to be marked. Something has got to be reported. Something has got to be developed. It's a bit like when you're in the car with the learners. You know, you, you know when something's going wrong. You can feel something's not right. The reactions are getting long. You have to intervene either verbally or by taking physical action. You're not going to be able to take physical action in these vehicles because they don't have dual controls. So what you have to do is you're waiting for all of these faults is going to be done on emotions of the trainer versus actions of the candidate. And that is key in subjective versus objective when you're actually marking in a fleet environment. The examiners don't quite do it the same way. They are given a governance and a strict parameter of what has to be placed in each marking criteria on the form. And that makes it more objective. You've got to be a little bit more subjective in the fleet because there are varying vehicles being used. There are varying loads being driven, uh, being, being, being conveyed. And companies have also have um, certain parameters and working practices that the drivers have to work within. And you need to know what those are as well and assess according to those at the same time. There's a lot more lateral thinking that needs to go in fleet. And unfortunately, the DVSA's fleet qualification, and I'm going to say this, is pants. It really is. It doesn't, it doesn't collate to any of this whatsoever. It is not fit for purpose in my view. And the, uh, I, I really, in the strongest terms, are, are urging the DIA to do something better, really are, because it's, uh, it doesn't go through occupational safety in a big way, and it doesn't have um, anything at all. As, as a DVSA, only really monitor the driving standards at provisional license uh, calibre. Uh, the, the, the qualification they have is not fit for purpose. And that really is why Fleet at the moment cannot be a compulsory register. It can't be. It's just not possible to do that. It'd be, uh, I, I'm not going to say what it'll be, but it's, uh, it's not uh, a situation that can be made a professional um, or, or a um, compulsory register at the moment. It's not fit for purpose for that. Uh, can, we, can we move on, please? So we're now looking at a typical example of an occupational driver assessment form. Beg your pardon, Tom, can we go back one, please? I haven't finished that slide. Sorry, I started on something and I didn't finish it. Recommendation, recommendations to management. Um, I mentioned about being a, a assessor only. You'd put in there about whether they'd be competent to driving. For people who are um, there for doing development as well, uh, the recommendation to management is all mingled into the report. So 
Uh, the report would be written from um, the grading that we've just looked at uh, and also the notes that you've made while you've been driving around, while you've been doing the assessing and also not just from the assessments, but how they have grown during the development process. OK, so if you um, feel that doing a second assessment on someone is not worth doing because it's, you know they're not going to make the grade anyway and you're going to be writing a reasonably not bad report, you're going to put the good bits in as well, but the report's not going to be that favourable, you'd much rather spend the time developing them than in your report, put down what happened in the initial assessment and then write down how they grew in the development area, but they haven't got to a stage yet where you could pass them off as competent to do the duty they're being asked to do, or you'd put in the report recommendations of what development is required, what further development is required, and when it should be done. So that's recommendations to management in that respect there. If we could move on, please. So looking at the at the form we've got on the um, descriptors on the left hand side saying risk assessment, obviously you'd feel in the top where it is. The flowery is the driver, is the, the daily driver checks, the, the road vehicle checks, okay, and you'd mark in their damage and also things that aren't working. This really is only an example, and of course the offside headlight not working would have been fixed before it went out. Okay. Um, so You've got descriptors here, first one, seating position, moving off, blah, blah, blah. So on that form there, you've got 20 descriptors. So that one's marked out of 80, okay? But on some some um, companies will give you their own and there'll be 25 descriptors, in which case you get marked out of 100. So you can see from the columns there, you've got one, two, three, four written in shadow, of which you mark over the top with these as to at the end of an assessment, the first assessment, you would then put down, um, write down in the grid there and add it up at the bottom. That person had 50. So if we went through um, to our um, risk rating, 50 would have been uh, a red because on this one, it's eight, eight out of 80 and 50 out of 80 is high risk at that point. So you would then look at the worst parts you've got there and set some objectives with these people of what they feel they should be working at by looking at what you've marked. If you mark anything on these forms, you must be able to give credence as to why you've marked it and reasons why you've done it. So you've got to treat them uh, with a lot of respect and you've got to treat them maturely. You don't talk to them like a learner. These people have got background knowledge, information, they have got experience and um, they are expecting to be developed and spoken to in a way that learning is going to take place. Because invariably, right down the line, with money being spent and money being tight through COVID-19 now, budgets might get cut. If anyone is put on the road, there's more than likely going to be some sort of debrief done by a line manager. And this person will be in front of that line manager. So if you don't go through what you've got on that report, uh, what you've got on, on the assessment sheet here, and also, when you write the report, you put things in the report that you haven't discussed with them, then there's going to be some very, very blank looks in the debrief. And the manager is going to accuse them of going out for a jolly and taking a day off effectively. And that isn't going to do them any good at all in front of their managers and probably won't do your reputation any good either if the client, the candidate is shouting and saying, shouting the odds and saying, well, you didn't say that. You didn't tell me this. You know, I don't know anything about this. And the manager's going to know their their staff quite well and their character quite well to know from the body language that that candidate is making as to whether this is all news to them or whether they are trying to swing the lead. So it can come back on you quite nastily if you're not careful. So we have to ensure that anything put on there, we can explain why it's on there and also report what's on there, especially the fact that money is now getting tighter with people going out on the road. COVID-19 has laid a lot of people off and we've already mentioned that roles are stretched and therefore it's a situation where um, people, the, the companies have to make the best they can of time resource when these people are out on the road. So the guys who are doing fleet now, we can expect to be, where you've been doing a whole day with people, we can expect to be done 
on a two to one. That's happened with a major company that I've got. They said we can't afford to do a one to one all day anymore, Howard. You're going to have to do a two to one now um, because needs are must. Um, we may even limit you down from going out with someone for a whole morning to us doing some uh, interventions in the classroom with them and put them out with you for two hours only and do what you can for two hours. Um, well, I've also actually had reports of one major organization that has stopped doing on road completely and are now doing um, video conferencing type things and phone calls. And that is it. They're not even getting behind the wheel of the van and doing it with a trainer at all. And yet they're being passed off as competent because they're answering um, a quiz at the end and are getting so many points and therefore they're deemed as competent to drive a vehicle without even feeling the load and without even feeling a wheel turn. And to my mind, that is quite irresponsible. But who am I? Um, if it comes under the reasonably practicable, if they can get away with it in a court, they'll try and get away with it. But um, it could be questioned in the court, I think. So what we've got to now, um, driving to conditions. This next slide, please, Tom, if you will. And we have to ensure that driving to conditions that we are, uh, I know the guys doing fleet, um, the conditions we've got, obviously, it's, uh, if it's really space and adhesion, but we also have to consider now that with COVID, and we have got people, companies with two tiered of, of driving ability, where the roads were used before, um, and there was less traffic around, the traffic volumes are starting to build up. But this is now localised. Uh, Manchester, unfortunately, or a lot of Manchester went down on lockdown at 10 o'clock last night. Um, we have not yet found out exactly how the ADIs are going to fare with that at the moment, where they've got to go back to um, uh, working, what they call it, um, uh, the workers, critical workers only uh, yet, and whether the test centres have actually been closed at the moment, we assume they have, but we haven't been told they have yet. So the, tra the, the uh, levels of traffic in that area are now going to change. People will start trying to go on bicycles and motorbikes again in order to alleviate going into public transport again. So road volumes will change. A lot of people will stay at home. Now, this gives an, uh, a bit of a false sense of security on the roads. In my area around Essex, where I am, the roads were very, very quiet. Uh, there are three roads that lead into my town, all of them country roads. Two are very like country lanes. And it was nothing for us to find whole families walking up the road with their dog uh, or two dogs literally in the middle of the road, paying no regard at all to think that, that any traffic would ever come out that road during the COVID crisis. Um, now the roads are opening up, the pedestrians have got a little bit lax with the use of crossing roads and checking both ways first are um, uh, I've only just starting to come back to realise that the roads are getting busy again. Uh, cyclists as well that have been having the free fall on driving, riding on the middle of roads and not really being worried about uh, cars being behind them have now got to start trying to discipline themselves. But their behaviour has changed and it's going to take a while to come back. And COVID has done that. Um, that, again, has been in the report by Driving for Better Business and also Highways England. Uh, that have said that some of the trunk roads by motorcyclists have been used in a different way and trunk roads and motorways being used differently by the lorries that are being able to transport goods through from port to port. Um, they found a difference in driver behaviour and there has been a marked spike in, although there's been a huge reduction during COVID of traffic volumes, the actual amount of speeding on cameras went up by one third in certain areas of the country. Now that I find quite quite phenomenal, that the, the traffic volumes had, had decreased dramatically, and yet speeding had gone up by one third. Again, that's a result of COVID. So we could be getting people in the vehicles that have now got over a certain threshold of points on their licenses, and you're having to deal with that and, and bring change their, their behaviors and trying to move them up onto a higher level of the GDE matrix and put them into level three or level four of the matrix where they're probably currently on level two. Incidentally, most general drivers are on level two. So we're looking at 
other things that have taken place in COVID as well, COVID effective as well, is where vehicles have been left idle for a long time. And some companies are only just coming back to work. If you are going back in, um, in the early stages and some you're going into a vehicle that hasn't been used for a long time, there are reports of birds nests um, being able to nest in the air intakes of vehicles. So definitely look under the bonnets, um, check for flat spots on wheels where the vehicles have been left uh, unattended for a long time. The, the tires have started to deflate and that then puts a flat spot on the tire. It might still be a little bit less if, uh, inflated than it was, but when the wheels go around, they're going to start getting um, a flat wheel noise on the tyres um, for a while. In fact, you could even be in a situation where if it's uh, causing a, a tremor on the steering wheel, that the tyres would have to be replaced. That's not uncommon at the moment after this COVID thing with the layoffs of vehicles. So that's something else to watch for as well. Um, also, bodywork damage. All right, people think it's been put up into a, a parking lot for a while and damage won't take place because the vehicle hasn't moved but other vehicles may have moved around it and there could be dents in vehicles that the owners of the vehicles are not aware of, which would also need to be brought to attention and um, and put right as well. Uh, mirrors broken, for example, if, if mirrors have been hit. Uh, cracks in windscreens. Uh, be very careful of stuff that's been left in the vehicles as well. If you go in to them for the first time where the heat's been in there, uh, they may have left sanitizing stuff in the vehicles ready to be used for the vehicle when it comes back for the first clean down for goodness sake be careful how you open up those bottles a report of a young 11 year old girl in america who opened up one in her four-wheel drive vehicle after being left in the sun and, and now has no sight in her left eye where the bottle actually exploded in her face so because of the alcohol in it so you must be a bit wary of these of these situations too now, that's pretty much all I've got to say about this now. We're pretty much on, on the end of this. We're going into slides now about um, DIAs, webinars, etc. So we're going to go into the questions now, if I may. And I've got, um, I'm in the wrong one. Let's try. There we go. We've done those two. Um, so Simon, have any standards checks taken place? I was supposed to have one in April. Should I contact them to sort out the date and wait to hear from the DVSA? Um, one thing I'd say to you, first of all, Simon, is are you certain that the DVSA has your correct address? You can change that up line, or online and then leave the DVSA to contact you because um, the, the normal standards checks are not a priority. Uh, the ones that are a priority are the part three standards checks taking place at the moment for the guys trying to qualify because they're within their two, two year time window. The DVSA are uh, trying to get those done. And also for the those AGIs who have come on the radar through complaints or their um, test, um, their, their test results are very poor. They're highlighting those guys as well. So if you are overdue for a standards check, and I can tell you that I'm now going six and a half years since my, my last one was 2014, I have contacted DVSA last year and they said, don't worry about it at the moment, wait. And that was why they were still trying to get through all the people who are on grade fours, grade five, grade six at that time. Um, don't worry about them not being in touch with you. They will be in touch with you shortly. Um, Roger, do you know how many fleet registered ADIs there are and any idea of how many work in that sector. I don't know how many are working at the moment, uh, but I believe that the uh, ADI on the fleet register, I believe that the DVSA, uh, the last figure I heard was nearly uh, 3,000. I don't know if they're still on there or not, but you've got to remember that the fleet register is a voluntary register. It's not compulsory. And therefore, there could be a lot more people practicing fleet on an ADI badge. Um, companies do not insist necessarily on an ADI, uh, on a fleet badge being uh, a proviso because an ADI under the Road Traffic Act 1988 is allowed to, um, to do fleet uh, and do, uh, on their ADI badge. They do not have to be registered to the fleet register unless the company the company's insurance company insist on it um, and they do occasionally they do 
Ian, are they self-analyzing this or are you are you marking? Um, self-analyzing should be taking place on anything to do with um, with the assessments. Uh, self-analyzing can take place after the event with reports in order for the um, the candidate or client, should I say, to be able, if there is a report that says, I would like the, the trainer recommends this guy gets seen sooner, uh, say three or four months, then the there should be a, a, a time allowed for self-reflection on and self-analyzing on that report uh, and a copy of the full report and marking sheet given to the candidate for them to be able to look at that and try to reflect and self-improve before the next lot of assessment. That's what really should be taking place. That really is down to the trainer to try and put that into the company as a system. Um, that would certainly help the company retain staff because it would make it look like they are actually investing in their, in their employees and give the employees a lot more self-worth to be able to take responsibility for something in their job. That's actually a proven fact and was um, uh, reported by Mika Hataka, um, who's a very, very um, uh, forward thinking road safety expert who um, works for the University of, oh, I've forgotten it, but he's in Finland anyway, wherever he is. He's in Finland, or is he Turkey? I can't remember, he's either Finland or Turkey, but he's actually uh, one of the forefront people in world road safety um, and is highly, highly regarded. He came up with that um, along the same time as when Ian, what's his name? The guy who did um, Can Drivers Really Teach Themselves? Ian Edwards. Uh, he and Ian Edwards have uh, a, a long-standing uh, relationship going with road safety. And uh, at the same time that Ian wrote that book is when uh, Mika, Mika brought, the, uh, brought that report out. Uh, Mark, if you don't have experience driving vans, how do you suggest getting experience? Do I need to get a part-time delivery job? Mark, that would be ideal. If you can actually earn money while you're getting experience and um, give somebody else the headache of the health and safety side of, of developing you, etc. Yeah, what a good way of doing it. Um, it would be expensive for you to go and hire vehicles just to drive them around. You ideally want the experience of these vehicles being full. So if you go and get a part-time job of driving vans, for example, a Cardo, if you've got a depot near you, doing home delivery stuff so you can actually see what these guys got to do. It's not all about driving. It's about um, safe loading. It's about consignments. It's about um, proof of delivery. It's about all this sort of thing, everything they've got to do in their job so you can understand their job role and understand um, the um, uh, tri time trials and tribulations that they are under, the pressures they are under, and get to talk to, um, be involved with organization and get to talk to other drivers of some of the mishaps they've had. This is all experience to your bow and is actually gold dust for you to be able to store uh, and use in your training of other people who you will be training later. Yeah, ideal, ideal thing to do. Ian's got another question here. I wonder if a driver was high risk, how that might make them feel. Um, it's how the trainer puts it across to him, Ian. It's all very well. If you, if you do it as a sandwich, you have got some very good driving traits here, and I'm quite, uh, I'm quite happy with what I've seen today. However, the weaknesses are this, but they are such a way that we are um, going to have to do further development for you in view that um, the occupational safety and health part of the company's policies for health and safety uh, may be compromised, and we've got to ensure that doesn't happen. Because if anything help happened later when you're driving, whether it's an at-fault incident by you or is somebody else at fault and it goes to court, and the records have to be produced of what your driving ability is, it could go against your company. That is how you'd put it to them. So I know you're saying the word feel there, how it might make them feel. It will probably make them deflated, but you've got to give them the reason why they are there. Um, it's all very well, but I mean, you can you can dress up something as much as you like. If it's, we've got a very, very poor system with the DVSA's booking system at the moment. It is a booking system. It works, 
but it is very poor. You're talking about a driver who can drive. He works, but it's poor. And you can't allow that to go on. There's got to be an improvement. And you can go back to the DVSA as much as you like and say, look, this needs to be sorted out. You can't go on like this with all of the risks that you've got of people not being able to get their tests at the right time, people going to the test centres and being told the test hasn't been booked, and people also um, uh, being given a test centre, a test application letter saying, you can apply for your test now when they passed their test last week. That's what's happening at the moment. So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to address it. You know, they might feel a bit down, but something has got to be said. Okay, David, Dave Carter, I've got, um, no one knows really, I can't think it is unlikely that there are more than a, than a thousand active fleet trainers or full-time equivalents. It's probably quite a bit less. Um, the, the fleet register has diminished a bit. Um, when I was with the DIA back in 20, uh, from 2009, 2014, I, I've rejoined recently, but when I was there then, the register was in the 4,000. But at that time, um, the health and safety on driving for work wasn't as tight as it is now. So I think a lot of them have gone by the wayside because they thought it's legislation. I don't want to get involved. I'm going to retire. Let's knock it on the head. It's money I can't afford to do. It's not a qualification. It's not really going to um, do anything for my business. I can do it anyway. So we have got quite a few fleet trainers out there, um, but the register has significantly reduced in numbers as I say, it is a voluntary register and will fluctuate anyway. Another question from Ian, does fleet badge quality, uh, does fleet badge quality will depend on who delivers it? Um, Ian, okay, let me just rephrase it because it's a bit of a misprint. Uh, fleet, does fleet badge quality, it is fleet badge quality really, it depends on who delivers it, doesn't it? You're absolutely right, Ian, it does depend on the delivery. Everything must be client-centered learning. It must still be done in the way that we do for standards checks. It's, it's no different than you taking, uh, training a full license holder and taking them for standards check. The delivery should be pretty much the same. Should be client-centered learned. You should let the, the, uh, the candidate take ownership of that session, but you guide it. Yes, they own it, you guide it, and you advise them on the better processes to take in order to keep the environment they are driving in and driving through safe at that time. That's what we have to do. Self-analysis does take place in the session too, because you pull them up and um, you would talk to them and say, how do you feel about this? Um, how do you think you can improve? And you, again, it's giving them ownership. So that's the um, that's that's what we'd be doing there is again is doing the same as you would do in a standards check um, standards check session. Um, I'm going to move on now to Maggie uh, Howard. I, I've, I'd like to undertake fleet training. Uh, is this training provided, and what cost is it? Um, the training for fleet can, if you want to go on the fleet register, can only be done by an organisation that is um, a uh, provider, a fleet provider for the, D, for the DVSA. Um, they are, what do they call them? A, a registered provider that they call them, preferred provider, that's what they call them, a preferred provider. They have been, had their, um, their training vetted, they've had their establishments looked at as well, and um, they can deliver the three tests or equivalent type of tests to an equivalent standard that would be able to get them the fleet qualification. That's what the DVSA are looking for. If you've got it higher than what the DVSA uh, produce, great. But to get the training, you would ideally need to do it with a registered provider for the DVSA. I wouldn't just go to anybody. Um, the problem with trying to do you want to try and do it locally if you can because there could be a lot of mileage involved if you're not careful uh, it is not possible to do fleet distance learning you've got to be out with somebody really and there would have to be a, probably a little bit of role play involved as well but you certainly need to have the experience of different sized vehicles really before you start to do the training in, in my view 
Uh, I, I, somebody might shoot me down in flames here, but in my view, you need the experience first. That's what you need of the driving the vehicles because fleet is not all about cars. You are dealing with uh, vans, lorries, and if you, I mean, something I've done for category B, you can do it on a category B. It's a bit tenuous, um, but um, you can move on. If you get the category C and category D licenses, then you can move into that sector when you've held the licenses long enough. But you certainly need the, not just to be a driver of a car. I, I tend to find, and no disrespect to any ADI who is in that situation, that the fleet trainers who have got just car tend to be um, lacking with experience to be able to answer the more strenuous questions. Either they've got to know rules and regulations and laws really, really well and be able to relate to an environment they've worked in where they can give the experience or they've got to be able to have driven those vehicles themselves in the first place. I, so I came out of transport for 50, I was in transport 15 years and I was also in the fire brigade 15 years at the same time. So I was driving fire engines, I was driving lorries, vans, etc. I needed up seven and a half tonne. I didn't want to go any further than that. I haven't got LGV8 or PCV, but I, I you know, I, I've got a lot of experience from SAFED and from Midas as well. So there's all sorts of experience things you can do with CPD to help you get the experience to help with fleet, but you do need to have the experience of the vehicles. Uh, Dave, so many fleet trainers get in, no fleet work. That's an uncomfortable truth. Yes, it is. But just because you've got a fleet badge, the DVSA does not give you um, the work. You've got to go and find it. The reason fleet trains don't get work is because either they don't market themselves or they don't know where to look. Now, that's a CPD um, module on its, own, on its own. And there is a module up for that in the DIPDE, the, the, the Diploma in Driver Education uh, that the DIA has. Um, that is possible for you to do that also does help with fleet because it also helps manage business as well. Um, uh, thanks for your for your confirmation, Ian. I agree that experience with different vehicle types is very helpful. Definitely, you're absolutely right. Um, and Maggie says she's driven three and a half ton vehicles, so that's going to put you in good stead. Uh, right, okay. Thank you, Maggie. What I say makes perfect sense. I'll send the check later, Maggie. Thank you. In my view, David says, a fleet badge is not enough. Rosper Gold is a must because you can end up sitting next to a just retired traffic officer. You will never be able to match his or her experience or skill level. That's possibly true, but you also have to appreciate that the people who are retired police officers have still got in their blood to make the vehicle do things the DVSA do not like them to do. And we're talking about get out there, make the vehicle move, that type of thing. Get out on the on the right and get into the middle of the road when you're doing a left bend, have a look. That's great for the people who have got very, very good um, reactions. But if you've got someone who's down on the GDE matrix, who's a general member of the general public, who is driving as a job, it's not a vacation, who is doing it for a job because they need income, they couldn't give two hoots whether that delivery got there or it didn't, and all they want to do is get from A to B, they are not going to be receptive to the, um, the responses that they need to have being trained sometimes where they'll be trained to be a little bit more advanced. We need to be defensive with the training. I know people have got to go from A to B in fleet, um, they're, they're timelined. Yes, they are. But we'd much rather they got there two or three minutes late safely than trying to look around a corner and then get hit by a motorcyclist who's leaning with his head on one side of the road and his machine on the other. And they're taking their head off. And that is the case that happens with people who are given information and a little information can be a very dangerous thing. So we've got to be a bit careful with saying that they've got to be next door to a certain person. Yes, I do. Don't, I don't I agree. Rosper Gold is good. I don't dispute that at all. But we can't say that that is the thing they've got to have. They must get suitable experience, uh, be suitably trained by suitably experienced people and not just another ADI who thinks they know the job. Now, I think you do need to be able to sing off the same hymn sheet. You're absolutely right, David. You're absolutely right there. Um, 
Roger saying, I would agree that experience is essential. I have suffered amongst many other things, including tanks. <laughs> Great, I love it. Okay. And Ian, um, uh, Ian saying about the, the ROSPA thing, who cares if DVSA don't like it? It is safe and DVSA needs to raise their standards. I, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. DVSA do need to raise the standards. We all know that. But at the moment, the highway code and uh, the, the highway code, unfortunately, is written of a book of blame. It's not written to share road space. The driving essential skills is written for a 12 and 13 year old because that's the average reading age of the UK. So the driving essential skills book cannot be subjective or objective enough to explain what the highway code is trying to say. That's the problem we're in. That's the mean denominator we have got. Nothing anybody can do about that until we can change those parameters. And the only way we're going to be able to change those parameters is to get the DVSA to understand that they have got to up their game on monitoring of driving standards. It's all very well them saying that they monitor the driving standards. The only people they actually train are their examiners. They do not train ADIs to be ADIs. And that's part of our problem. And I think that we need to have some sort of breakaway in order for our industry to monitor itself and the DVSA to merely do the sign off. And that's that's my personal view. And I, I've, I've brought this up to the DVSA already. They do know. I'm not saying anything they don't know about already. So I, I do believe that that is the case that we should be doing at the moment. And I think that after the COVID is out of the way, that there's got to be something towards that aim. I really do. Anyway, we're going to have to wrap this up, guys, because it's now quarter past 12. And some of you have taken us a lot of your time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, one last one here from Ian, which is a comment. Highway code definitely needs to be rewritten. Uh, no book says what's right or wrong. Um, and it's dynamic risk assessment of the driver and whatever makes it safe. You're absolutely right, Ian. And thanks for all your input here. I hope, I'm going to stop now, but I hope that everyone who's been listening to this has actually got some CPD out of the questions because there's been some quite wide ranging views there. And I haven't looked at the chats. I haven't had time to, and I'm not really able to at this moment, but I hope that there's been some useful information in the chats as well um, and that you've managed to take something from this. I hope it has met the objective that's been, that we're supposed to do this today. Uh, I'm going to sign off now. Suffice to say that this webinar has been recorded and any points in there you want to pick up again will be on uh, line on the Academy. Um, it should be on by Tuesday. I can't see Matt, our IT guy, doing it at the moment because we're having a, a major move around in the office because we're all going back into work and we have to ensure we've got social distancing there at the moment. So our one office is being spread into three and Matt has to wire it all up with comms and everything else. So he's the guy that puts us up. So if you can just bear with us until probably Tuesday, Wednesday for us to get this online, we'd really appreciate that. Um, anybody from the Manchester area, we do realise that you went into lockdown yesterday at 10 p.m. and we are trying to get all the information we can from the DVSA to find out how you're going to be affected in terms of testing and in terms of whether you're still able to go out or whether it's going to be um, key workers only. We haven't yet got the response. When we do, we'll put it out on a direct MailChimp. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. Um, thank you all for your attendance. We have another webinar next week which is uh, me working with the motorcycle fraternity um, about the COVID thing, how it's all been positively, how we've come out positively, positively from that. Um, and so uh, I'm going to sign off now. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I hope it's met uh, all your expectations. Okay, so goodbye for now. Take care. Bye-bye.